to introduce uh, Dr. Gabriel Lipschitz. Uh, he is a board certified, fellowship trained vascular interventional radiologist with the Cedar Sinai Mark Taper Foundation Imaging Center. Uh, he, along with Dr. Friedman, are our neuroendocrine tumor interventional radiologists. They sit with us weekly in our tumor boards and uh, really are instrumental in the care of our patients. Uh, so please introduce uh, Dr. Lipschitz. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about minimally invasive treatment options for neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases today. Uh, so there are several different options that we have for treatment as interventional radiologists. Percutaneous ablation, transarterial embolization, which includes chemo and bland embolization, and then transarterial radioembolization. So I'm going to start off by talking about ablation. We have multiple types of ablation. Microwave ablation is the most common ablation that we use here and, and, the, and that I use. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the scenario, we may use RFA. Uh, cryoablation we don't use very often in the, in the liver, but we use in other areas. IRE is a newer technology, and alcohol we don't use much anymore. But indications for ablation are these. Typically, we use ablation where we have oligometastatic disease or just a few lesions in the liver that we're going to treat. Um, people who have tumor growth despite therapy uh, and who are symptomatic or candidates, uh, often these patients are not candidates for surgical resection and you need to have adequate liver function. So microwave ablation, the technology is, 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 is a really great one. Uh, we use microwave energy to cause heat, which basically the, uh, it causes agitation and oscillation of water molecules, uh, and that creates friction heat and kinetic energy, and heat from kinetic energy. And the microwave uh, propagates through, uh, through different tissue types, and it propagates through desiccated tissue, uh, which is a problem with RFA, actually. RFA is a circuit, and so uh, desiccated tissue has high impedance, and it prevents uh, the circuit from working properly. So microwave ablation, you get bigger ablation zones. It's more efficient. Uh, so this is the microwave ablation probe here. And when we do our procedure, we do it under CT or ultrasound guidance uh, in, in all uh, types of ablation, uh, whether we use RFA, microwave, cryo. And we uh, then place the probe through the, this is the anterior abdominal wall here. So we place the probe through the liver. This dark area is tumor. So we're placing the probe into the tumor, and then we would perform our ablation. So the ablation size uh, depends on the wattage that we use and the time. So the higher the wattage here, uh, 65 watts at 10 minutes, the larger our ablation zone. And this is with a single probe. If we add two probes, we get an even larger ablation zone. And this is a relatively short period of time for ablation. Um, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, it takes, takes a little bit longer. It's probably more of a 10 to 15 minute ablation. Um, and again, it's limited by uh, desiccated tissue that develops as you burn. So your ablation size typically isn't as large. Um, and so you, you aren't able to as easily create a margin. You want to have a margin around the, 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 the tumor that you're treating. So you kill all the, the cancer cells. And then cryoablation is, uses freezing temperatures. Uh, to cause cell death. And uh, the nice thing about cryo is that you can really see, this is actually a probe in the kidney here. The nice thing about cryo is that you can see the ice ball formation, so you can really keep track of your ablation zone. With microwave and RFA, you can't really keep track of your, your ablation zone as well. It's harder to see with CT. And so you have to use your tables and your experience to know when to stop. But with cryo, you can really see your ice ball form. The problem with cryo is that it takes much longer. It takes 20 to 30 minutes. It also uses a larger ablation probe. Uh, in the liver, you have issues with bleeding that we worry about, less issues with microwave and RFA, so we tend to favor those in the liver. Um, and then you have something called cryo shock, which is a rare thing, but uh, it, we, we, we try and avoid that if possible. Um, so irreversible electroporation is a great new technology. Um, uh, it's really promising. Uh, it's in its earlier stages of development, so um, you know it, it takes a long time to use. It requires really precise placement of the ablation probes within 1.5 to 2 centimeters of each other, and it requires multiple probes. So it, it takes a long time to do. It's really tedious. But the advantage of IRE is that it preserves the extracellular matrix. 
And we're, when we're trying to ablate uh, tumors in the liver and the kidney, and if they're close, the tumors are close to vital structures such as the main bile duct, if you use thermal energy or microwave, you could destroy the bile duct and create bile strictures or bile leaks. But IRE has the potential to preserve that, that bile duct, the, the uh, extracellular matrix, and uh, prevent injury of the bile duct so you can uh, perform ablations close to those vital structures. Um, so that's a really promising technology that I, I, I hope to use more often in the future. Um, so this is a, a picture of ablation here. You can see that there's a hypervascular tumor in the liver. And this is post-ablation. This dark area is the ablation zone. This is the ablation track. And then uh, in follow-up, you can see that the ablation zone has shrunk over time and there's no residual tumor. Uh, so, you know, how, how does thermal ablation work in the liver? There's lots of, study done, lots of studies done with RFA. Uh, there, this is a study from uh, 2007 with 63 patients. They had quite, this is a large number of tumors for ablation, six tumors and 2.3 centimeters is, on average is a, is a good size. 57% uh, of these patients had symptoms. So the results were quite good. 94% of patients had symptom relief at one week, and 75% of those had complete or significant relief. And the medium length of symptom relief was for 11 months. Um, if the lesions were smaller, uh, people did better in terms of survival. Women had better survival in the study. And the wonderful thing about ablation is that it's pretty low risk uh, in the right patient. So perioperative mortality was low, and there was no mortality. Uh, moving on to embolization, we have two types of embolization, chemoembolization or TACE, and then bland embolization. Uh, chemoembol so embolization in general, uh, we, we do it through the hepatic artery. And the idea is that the, that the tumors uh, live off of arterial blood supply, um, whereas the normal liver relies mostly on uh, blood supply from the portal vein. So you can target tumors by uh, treating through the artery. And with chemoembolization, you inject particles that are, or oil that's impregnated with chemo. So you both block the artery and infuse chemo into the tumor. Um, uh, so you have two tools. Whereas bland embolization, you just block the artery. Um, and here's a picture of the particles uh, going into the arteries that feed the tumor. So transarterial chemoembolization, there are two types. There's conventional taste, which is chemo mixed with oil. And then there's drug-eluting beads, which are beads that are impregnated with the chemotherapy, as I just mentioned. And the, the idea with the uh, uh, drug-eluting beads is that uh, the beads release chemo over time. So you get uh, a buildup or a, a release of the chemo into the tumor over the course of a couple weeks. There's less release of the chemo uh, systemically, and you get less systemic toxicity. Um, but there are some drawbacks that I'll explain. Uh, bland embolization, as I mentioned, you just block the artery. Uh, we usually use something called embospheres. Uh, so indications for taste uh, and bland embolization, less than 75% replacement of tumor with limited extrahepatic disease. Patients who have tumor growth and are symptomatic are candidates. Often these patients, again, are not surgical candidates and you need to have adequate liver function. The procedure involves uh, accessing the femoral artery. Um, uh, sometimes we actually use the radial artery these days. Uh, and we then put catheters uh, through the femoral artery up into the celiac artery, which gives off the hepatic artery, which feeds the liver and tumors. So this is a CT scan. These bright areas are all tumor. And on the angiogram, these dark uh, uh, spots here are large tumors, and these are the arteries that are feeding that tumors, those tumors. So you basically place a microcatheter. Uh, you can either place it distally into the, the uh, branches of the artery that are feeding the tumor, or if you have a lot of tumor, you would treat more proximally and inject beads from, from here. Uh, Post-embolization is a common uh, syndrome that we, uh, that we deal with after embolization. It involves pain, fever, nausea, elevated. Uh, LFTs and white count, patients often become malaise, and because of this, uh, we admit patients overnight for uh, um, observation. Uh, so how do chemo and bland embolization do? Well, they both do quite well. Uh, in 2008, there's a study of 100 patients, uh, half had tastes with uh, chemo embolization and half had bland embolization. 
morbidity, 30-day mortality, symptom improvement, and survival were all pretty much the same. And here's a table that shows 14 studies uh, and their results. And I just want to show you that you know, radiographic response and symptomatic improvement was quite good, whether you use bland embolization or chemoembolization, and survival was also pretty good. Uh, but we tend to favor bland embolization now with neuroendocrine tumor. And the reason is, is there was a study done uh, in the last couple of years uh, with only 13 patients. They used drug-eluting beads, and over half the patients developed bilomas, which is a leak of bile, uh, a contained leak of bile in the liver. And four out of the seven patients who developed those leaks actually required a, a drainage procedure. So because of that, we, we tend to favor bland embolization for metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, moving on to radioembolization, it's a, it's a similar procedure to the chemoembolization, the bland embolization. We access the femoral artery, we would catheters into the hepatic artery, but instead of injecting uh, uh, spheres or, um, or the, the uh, chemoembolic material, we inject radioactive microspheres and the tumors are hypervascular, they suck up blood supplies, so they suck up the majority of these radioactive beads, and the radioactive beads uh, decay over the course of a couple weeks and radiate the surrounding uh, tumor. Uh, so the radioisotope that, that we use is yttrium-90. It has a 64-hour half-life. It's a pure beta emitter, which basically means that it, it, uh, the, uh, the radioactivity only travels approximately 11 millimeters in tissue, so you get a local treatment response. The radiation stays within the liver, and it doesn't work outside the liver. Uh, there are two types of radioactive material that we use for radioembolization. Uh, uh, resin microspheres called surspheres, and then glass microspheres called therosphere. For neuroendocrine tumor, we tend to use surspheres. Uh, contraindications are basically abnormal liver function. If patients have um, a, a disruption of the ampulla of Vader, uh, which is the biliary sphincter, uh, you have a higher risk of developing an infection after the procedure. Um, uh, we need to protect against non-target embolization, so you don't want your radioactive uh, beads to go to the lung or to the bowel. Um, so if, if that's a concern, uh, then that's a contraindication. Uh, we typically treat people who have less than 50% hepatic involvement with tumor. If you have disseminated extrahepatic disease and poor functional status, those are also contraindications. So the procedure uh, typically involves three steps. First, there's a mapping procedure where we assess for those aberrant arteries. We make sure that those radiac material uh, is going to go uh, to the liver and not to bowel, where it can cause ulcers. Uh, we also inject a small test dose of radiation of technetium uh, to measure the shunting through the liver to the lungs. If that shunt to the lungs is too high, then you're going to send a lot of radiation to the lungs, and you can cause radiation lung disease, which we want to avoid too. Um, so after we do the mapping procedure, we're able to calculate a dose. We order the dose. Two weeks later, uh, we bring patients back for their first uh, procedure where we treat the, the first lobe of the liver, and then we wait about a month and we treat the second lobe of the liver. Uh, so how does radioembolization do? Well, there was uh, a study by Kennedy, uh, almost 150 patients. It's the largest study uh, series with uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. They use spheres. Um, and the results were, uh, were impressive. They had disease control in 85 to 90% of patients, uh, complete response in almost 3%, a partial response of 61%, and then they stabilized disease in 23%. Um, and the major adverse events were quite low. So, you know, most people didn't have any major out, uh, adverse events, and the most common uh, significant adverse event was fatigue. So this is, uh, these are some pictures, the uh, angiograms of the mapping procedure where we look for uh, aberrant arteries that feed bowel. Uh, so this is the GDA. Uh, we often uh, will, uh, we treat beyond this GDA that, that feeds small bowel normally. So these days we don't typically coil that off. Uh, but this artery is clearly feeding bowel. This is something that we would uh, coil because it's in our treatment area. It comes off the right hepatic artery here. So you can see that it, that, that vessel is now coiled as well as the GDA, and it would now be safe to treat. Uh, after the mapping procedure, I mentioned that we uh, want to measure the shunt of radiation uh, to the lungs. So this is the nuclear medicine study that helps us with that. 
Uh, this black stuff is all the radiation in the liver, and then this circle is surrounding the lungs. It's measuring the uh, radiation in the lungs here, um, and, and then you figure out the percent of radiation that goes to the lungs versus the liver. Uh, if there's too much radiation that goes to the lungs, then that's a problem, and we would probably avoid treating. Uh, so these are CT scans of uh, pre- and post-radio embolization. These dark spots are all tumor uh, at baseline, and then 26 months follow-up. Uh, the spots are much smaller, and these areas are, these even darker areas are necrotic dead tissue. Um, so that was a nice result. Uh, here's another bilobar radio embolization for neuro neuroendocrine tumor. Again, big dark spot and multiple smaller dark spots. Uh, at baseline, and over time, uh, everything shrunk quite well. Uh, another bilobar radioembolization for mid-gut carcinoid. This is fairly bulky disease. This would kind of be at the upper limits of, of what we would treat with radioembolization. Um, these are all tumor here, these dark areas. Uh, and three months later, they actually had quite a nice response, so a, a real significant shrinkage in, in these tumor areas. So in conclusion, we have several options for minimally invasive treatment for liver-dominant metastatic disease. Uh, ablation, embolization, we favor bland embolization, and then radioembolization. And all have been shown to decrease symptoms and control disease progression with high degrees of success. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to come uh, speak to you.